Hello and welcome to the ODI Friday Lunchtime Lectures. It's my pleasure today to introduce Dean Butler. Uh, Dean, has, Dean is here today to present uh, details around can the financial system ever be open? Uh, Dean's background, he's actually worked for the FSA and the Prudential Regulation Authority and the Bank of England for nearly 20 years. He specialises is in valuation and capital modelling in both the banking and life insurance sector. After he retired from the bank in January 2018, he set up Erasmus with Kevin Dowd from the Durham University, a project to keep an eye on the regulatory institutions such as the Bank of England and the Financial Conduct Authority, and to campaign for regulatory reform, particularly around the need for financial regulatory system to be more open. Um, sorry, sorry, Dean. <laughs> just before I, uh, just before we get started. Uh, if anyone has any questions in here today, uh, at the end of the, the presentation, please be aware that you will need the mic first before uh, you ask any question because we need our viewers online to hear it. And if anyone is joining us remotely today via the live stream, if you have any questions for Dean, please ask them via the Twitter channel and use the hashtag ODI, Friday, uh, ODI Fridays. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Dean. Thank you very much, Brian. Okay. Um, as Brian says, I'm going to talk about the financial system and whether it can ever become open. Yeah, so um, it, it's going to be a bit of a ramble. Um, I've got 35 slides. I'm going to aim to talk through it by about 40 minutes past 45. Um, it's loosely connected by a bit of logic, which is explained on the agenda here as follows. So I'm going to start with bureaucracies. And um, by bureaucracy, I mean here regulators. Um, then I'm going to sort of go on to say, well, what is the nature of a bureaucracy? And my, my thesis here is it's, it's a secretive, it's essentially a secretive organization. That's what a bureaucracy is. Well, it is more than that, but um, uh, the, key, the key thing here is it, it's secrecy. I'm then going to connect secrecy to financial stability. Why, why should a secret of bureaucracy, a secret, a secret of regulator, why should that um, be a threat to financial stability? Um, doom to failure I'm going to cover in the next slide. So I'm going to start, sorry about this, rooting around malfunction. I think there's actually a quote behind this which Wales used. This, this I think he wrote in Usenet around February 97 or 98. Um, it's something like the internet rules uh, roots around censorship or something like that. Perhaps someone here will know. Um, he interpreted this as follows. Uh, the internet interprets any type of centralized planning. And by centralized planning, we mean bureaucracy. You know, the Bank of England, regulators like the PRA, the FCA, the FRC, all these acronyms. The command and control model, okay, that's, that's your centralized planning is doomed to failure. So that's, that's the title. That's doomed to failure by the very nature of the network. This is inevitable. So let's, let's unpick what he's saying here. Obviously, it's something about centralized planning, command and control, bureaucracy, the same thing. Uh, he's saying it's doomed to failure. And he's writing in 97 when the internet was just, um, just sort of starting to get sort of interesting to many people. Um, and there was a theory around then, and perhaps still now, that uh, open data and the open nature of the internet, which means not just reading information but writing as well, it's doomed to failure. It's inevitable. It's part of the nature of the network that it will sort of destroy. It will destroy the sort of bureaucratic command and control sort of uh, thing that sort of underlies currently, or, or then and currently underlies the financial system. So. Sorry about this. Bullet points. Right. I don't know how much people know about Wikipedia. I think everyone knows it as an encyclopedia that they use. Um, it began in 2000, 2001 as a sort of free market in knowledge. Wales himself was around then, about the mid-90s. He actually worked in financial markets. He worked at the Chicago Mer Mercantile Exchange. And um, he was what's called an upstairs trader. So he looked in information coming through on the network, which was just beginning to get started then, and he would work out what's called an arbitrage. He'd see two, two things trading in different markets, and he would connect those electronically and sort of buy one, sell the other, and make a small profit, but many, many, many of these profits. Um, he was also influenced by quite an important essay by, by Hayek, Friedrich Hayek, who nobody likes now because he's sort of associated with Margaret Thatcher, and nobody likes Margaret Thatcher. Um, 
So he was influenced by Hayek, who had a theory that uh, there are two types of knowledge, the scientific knowledge, philosophical knowledge, and that's what sort of people in white coats and scientists, that's what they, they look at, knowledge that stands for all time. And then there's what he called circumstantial knowledge, which is like, how much do people need of a certain good? And Hayek said, well, this is all distributed. It's everywhere. So if someone's sort of looking at the price of shipping or the price of cabbages or tomatoes somewhere, uh, they know when there's a scarcity because the price of that goes up. So they will, they will, try, and, they will try and find cabbages or tomatoes and sell them at, at the best price. And that sort of even, evens out the whole sort of price structure. And that is better, Hayek said, than this sort of command and control sort of network where it's all controlled from the very centre. Um, and Wales was, or, or claims to be, influenced by that idea. And he had the idea, actually he and Larry Sanger, it was actually Larry Sanger who founded Wikipedia with Wales. Um, they had the idea of um, scrapping the peer review process. They began Wikipedia with something called Newpedia, which was operating in the traditional way. You have a peer review process, sort of seven steps of how you get the thing published. And that, that's still how the academic world works. Um, he said, he and Larry said, well, forget peer review. Let's just anyone edit. Anyone can log in and they can edit Wikipedia. And the idea was that um, someone called Ward Cunningham said, if, if, if you want to get the right answer on the internet, just, just give the wrong answer. And then people will leap in. And I think that was right. People will leap in and correct that. So let anyone edit. Uh, and that's how Wikipedia started. And it sort of worked well for about six years until 2007. And it very rapidly became a bureaucracy. If you, try and, if you try to edit Wikipedia then, no problem. Any time before 2007, you would be welcomed. Uh, now, if, if anyone's tried now to change something, instantly you'd be saying, no, 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 you've broken rule WP14B or whatever it is, and you're directed somewhere, and uh, your edit will soon be deleted. And that, that process of forming itself into a bureaucracy with a hierarchy and a whole bunch of rules and regulations. Just, just look them up. If you, look, if you do WP colon something on the, um, on the search thing in Wikipedia, you'll find all these rules. Um, so it very quickly became a bureaucracy. But, OK, Wikipedia, Wales and Sanger, and a whole bunch of other people around about that time, um, they, they called themselves libertarians. Actually, Randians, if anyone's heard of Ayn Rand and objectivism, they were sort of proto-libertarians. Um, they started Wikipedia, and for a long time, the first few years, they, they were running the place. If a group of libertarians quickly turned themselves into a bureaucracy, which is, which is, anything, which is everything a, a libertarian would hate, there must be strong natural forces that enable a bureaucracy to go. That's my thesis. Bureaucracies are natural. They grow very quickly, get any bunch of people together to do something, uh, to organize themselves, and they will turn themselves into a bureaucracy. So, what is a bureaucracy? Right, that's an illustration um, illustrating Franz Kafka's novel, The Castle, which is about bureaucracy. So you can see the castle there up on the hill. You can see this individual here sort of arriving to the castle. Uh, that, in my view, uh, and in, uh, that, in my view, is the wrong interpretation of that book. Uh, Many people have interpreted Kafka's work as the individual, the lone individual, pitted against the might of the bureaucracy in the castle and so forth. Um, Hodson et al. wrote a very good paper on bureaucracies, and they said, no, that's not right. It's not, it, what Kafka was writing about as a bureaucrat, remember Kafka, for much of his career, was not a writer. He was actually an insurance regulator. He was a lawyer. He did actually a job very similar to what, what I did before I left the bank in... January last year. Um, he was a lawyer, he was a bureaucrat, and he understood how it all works very well. And um, Hodson say, this is what characterizes a bureaucracy. It's, uh, first of all, divergent goals. So you look inside a bureaucracy, you work in one. Um, you get a whole bunch of people who want to do different things. There's a sort of free market inside the bureaucracy, um, which is naturally not well controlled from the top. Um, now, the second point, patrimonialism, this sort of hierarchical structure, true. All bureaucracies have a system of hierarchy where you're controlled by a manager who's controlled by other managers, who's controlled by very senior managers. I think the Bank of England has about 12 of these, 12 of these hierarchical layers, at least. Um, so you have these divergent goals at the same time, 
sort of controlled by this patrimonial structure that sort of radiates energy down from the very top. You also have unwritten rules, which I'm going to talk about at length in a minute. Um, I shall say unspoken rules. So the rules that bureaucrats follow, which are not written down, but they agree amongst themselves. They verbally agree that uh, th this is what we're going to do, but do not minute that. You, you'll, you'll often hear that in a bureaucracy. You'll go to a meeting and some senior person says something and says, ah, do not minute that. And that's because if it's written down, then someone will see it. There'll be a freedom of information request and then all sorts of bad things will happen. So there are, there are unwritten rules, but there are also, I shall argue in a minute, unspoken rules whereby even the people themselves in the bureaucracy do not say what they're up to. And finally, there's, there's chaos. And obviously, you have these two things, divergency, patrimonialism, rules that are sort of mock bureaucracy. Um, that's going to result in chaos. And as Hodgson says, and, and I agree, Kafka's genius was just not in identifying these elements, but his insight that these are a normal, essential, foundational part of how an organisation works. They're essential to bureaucracy. If you look at any bureaucracy, you'll find that. Um, I would add, from my own experience of bureaucracies, um, another feature that is important about them is that it offers people who are not gifted with a great genius, which is 99% of us, with a title. Titles are really important. If you ask why the Bank of England has 14 or more layers of bureaucracy, it, it's because the title, if you're head of something, it's a great reward. It's very cheap. You don't have to give them a rise or anything like that. Um, so title is very important in a public, in a public organisation. Also in private, um, commercial organisations are bureaucracies too. You look at any large bank, e even a small, even a small hedge fund, um, they're bureaucracies as well. They have to deal with they have to deal with other bureaucracies. And as I say, they naturally any group of people will naturally form themselves to do this. Bureaucracies also have a character or ethos. Uh, the, the Greek ethos, from which ethics is related, the word ethics, is, it just means a habit or custom. So if you ask about someone's ethics, well, that's just what, that's what a bunch of people do. And if that's what they do, if that's the way they've organised themselves, it must, must be kind of OK. Um, character can be just the culture or tradition of that bureaucracy or organisation. It can also be defined by principles that are written down. Here, I think the church is a good thing. You have, you have the church, which, which is an organisation. The Catholic Church and the Anglican Church and many other churches are bureaucracies, um, and the ethos defined, is defined both by a tradition and a culture. You know, this is what people do. Uh, also by scriptural authority, where you've got a bunch of stuff written down. So in the Catholic Church, you've got the New Testament. Uh, you've also got the Old Testament, and there's an odd sort of relationship between those two. Um, and sometimes these conflict. Now, there was a famous medieval dispute about apostolic poverty. So the apostles, Jesus' apostles, um, they were meant to be poor. They were meant to have no property. Uh, by the time you reach the 13th century, the church is an immensely powerful and wealthy organisation because um, people would leave castles, property, money to them uh, in order to be saved and be prayed for. So it, it had an enormous amount of power and property, and then you have this problem, well, how many apostles, the disciples of Jesus, had no money, no possessions, what are we doing here? And there was all sorts of, uh, th those arguments actually turned into, sort of turned into the Reformation, but we won't go into there. The, the point is that a, a bureaucracy is both a culture and a tradition, and a bunch of things written down that sort of says, look, this, this, these guys, this is, this is how you do it, these are the principles. Right, now, unspoken character. I think <coughs> there are unwritten rules, but there's also unspoken rules. Uh, so what can we say about Goldman Sachs? I'm not saying this, by the way. I'm just quoting somebody. Would I ever say anything about Goldman Sachs? Uh, it's everywhere. It's, it, it's one of the most powerful investment banks, probably the most powerful, and it's a great vampire squid wrapped around the face of humanity, relentlessly jamming its blood funnel into anything that smells like money. That's, that was written in Rolling Stone in 2005, and, it, and it's... I can't say whether that's true or not, but it, it's, a, it's a great quotation. Now, that fact about Goldman, this is an organisation I know pretty well because I regulated it for, for some time. Um, that is understood by anyone who joins Goldman as an associate. That, that, that's what we're for. We are, we, are, we are to jam our collective blood funnels into money wherever we can find it. That's, that's, 
That's what the organisation does. And that is understood. No one from Goldman's would ever say that. I've never heard anyone. Um, well, I kind of have, but uh, that was over a few drinks. Uh, the, the very this, is a, this is a case where the very character, the very nature of an organisation must be hidden from itself. And I promised, I promised a quotation from Sartre, which, which you can read here. Um, it's a great, th this is a great bit of sort of novelism. Sartre is essentially a novelist, I think, not a philosopher. The waiter in the cafe, the word little appears five times. He does little this, little that. And then he, he tries to imitate in his walk the inflexible stiffness of some kind of automaton. And that, that's, that's a great quote. And, and that, is just, that is just a quote. It's writing about waiters. But the, the key point is at the end, he's playing, amusing himself. Yeah, but what is he playing? We need not watch long. He is playing at being a waiter in a cafe. It's all play. Uh, and likewise, as I'll say in a minute, perhaps the regulators are playing at being regulators. Oh, yeah, we've got Marx as well. Um, <coughs> Right, the spirit, yeah, so we've got it. The spirit, the culture, the ethos of the bureaucracy is the secret of the mystery. Um, two things here. Secret, I'm going to talk about. Mystery, mystery is kind of different. Mystery is something sort of supernatural, I guess. It's, it's not, you can't explain it logically. It's just a, a reverence and awe that people feel about the mystery. And, and Marx here, I generally wouldn't agree with Marx. Um, Marx has got it right. There's a sort of reverence we have for those in authority, um, despite the internet, uh, that makes us respect it and it kind of makes us lazy and makes us do or believe what the authority does or wants us to believe. So, yeah, the mind and the disposition of the state, great words, appears, therefore, to the bureaucracy as a betrayal of its mystery. So the bureaucracy must never say what it is. Not only will it not say to itself what it is, it will not say to the public or write to the public. It, not, it will not... It will not say what it's about. No, Goldman's would never say, it would say we're doing God's work, perhaps ironically. Does everyone know that? It's famous. Lloyd Blankfein, the head, the head of Goldman Sachs, said, we are doing God's work. I think it was a bit of a smile on his face when he said that. Um, but yeah, the bureaucracy will never say, will, will never say what it's really about, uh, or that would betray its mystery. Yeah, yeah, and Mervyn King wrote a quite expensive and actually not a very good book in 2013. He, he says there, he, um, it's full of anecdotes and stuff, quite interesting, but as far as it goes. He asked the legendary central banker, his words, Paul Volcker, for one word of advice. Volcker, who's six foot six or something, looked down at me from his great height and said, mystique. And that, and that, and that if you look at the 19th century history of central banking, that was very much what, and still is, what the Bank of England is all about. It must preserve its mystery because that mystery gives it its authority. So if Mark Carney, who's on the news all the time at the moment, says, you know, Brexit is very bad, uh, that's what it is. You know, believe him. You know, he's, and he's one of the most influential people in the country today. Um, this is a kind of a joke slide. Um, what do you, how do you research secrets? What are they? Well, the point about a secret is... It's not there. You can never find it. Uh, that, that actually is from another research. I, I tried to research secrets and say, what academic literature is on secrets? Well, not very much. Couldn't find any. Um, there's, there's no scientific, scientific knowledge of secrets. What are they? And if you think about it a bit more, what, what are secrets? You know, what, what, why do they exist? You, you can understand things like private personal secrets, family secrets, that sort of thing, stuff about you. You can understand why those are secret, but, but secret goes far beyond that. A secret is not just something you omitted to say to somebody or forgot to say. It's something you're deliberately keeping from other people. You know, what are these and why, why do they exist at all? Well, one of these, uh, there, are many, there are many of these, one of these is what's called the safe harbour doctrine or thesis. What are regulators are about? What's a, what's a financial regulator about? Well, it's to tell people... Um, it's, it's to protect the general public from bad things like vampire squids. Um, but you're also taught as a regulator, you must not give a, what's called a safe harbour to the people you regulate. If you give a safe harbour, you say, you say, OK, Goldman's, whoever, Merrill, Bank of America, yeah, it's OK to do X. You can do that. That has protected that firm from any bad action it does in the future concern, which is around X. They will just say, 
yeah, yeah, but you know, the lawyers come in, you know, we're going to sue you for a billion pounds. Um, you did X. Yeah, yeah, but the regulator said it was okay. Here's the thing, here's the letter where it said, yeah, X is okay. Um, th there was even, I think regulators now, I think the PRA approves models now, but when I first joined in 99, when it was the FSA, uh, you're not allowed to use the word approve. We've not approved your capital model. We've recognized it. We've sort of seen it's there, but we're not. Um, and that's why regulators avoid principles-based regulation. Principles-based is, 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 is like, don't be evil. Don't do bad things. Don't steal. That's principles-based. Um, regulators don't like that because it means they have to sort of interpret that, say, OK, you were stealing, and they might, get, they might get sued for that. Far better to say, well, stealing consists in doing, and here's a list of 999 things that stealing is. Uh, very easy to game because there's always a thousandth thing which, which any, any normal person will say was stealing, but, um, but is not in that list of 999 things. So regulators, and actually the word regulator sort of comes from Latin regular rule. So you'd kind of expect they, they prefer rules. Um, so the very nature of regulation, you know, what is this? We, we want to stop X. Or we want, we want the firm to do X to stop Y, which is a bad thing. We want, we want a regulated firm to do X. So why not say, yeah, X is OK and Y isn't? But you can't do that because of the safe harbour problem. So really, the regulator isn't a regulator at all by its very nature. Yet this character, i.e. the character of the regulator not being a regulator, but playing it, playing it being a regulator, like the waiter is playing it being a waiter, that can never be explicitly stated. It must remain unspoken. I hope everyone's seen Alien. It's a great, it's a great, it's a great film. This is the, I don't know what it's called. It's the, sh it's the thing that sort of comes out and grabs John Hurt by, by the face. And um, if you prick that little, they actually in the film they prick that little bit there, that tendon or joints, and this blood came out, which sort of goes through three layers of the ship, goes through the steel hull. Uh, it's so poisonous. And one of the characters said, "Yeah, Parker." That's a wonderful defense mechanism. You, you, if you attack the thing, it will just sort of, the blood will come out and kill you. Uh, and, and that perhaps is an analogy there. I wouldn't want to say that, but perhaps is an analogy with regulation. Right, right, conspiracy theory. I love conspiracy theory as I go through the net all the time. Sort of, there's, there's a whole lot of, there's 9 11. There's also Flat Earth Movement, which I came across quite recently. Who, who would believe the Earth is flat? Well, it's a conspiracy. You know, NASA is conspiring to sort of take photos, which is really just CGI, it's all made up, uh, to pretend to us the Earth is round, really it's flat, it's a conspiracy, 9-11, government blew up buildings, is that what it happens, and they just say, oh, it's, it, was, it was ISIS or whoever it was at the time. Um, yeah, no conspiracy theories can possibly have worked in a bureaucracy, they could not possibly know what it's like. Um, the working levels, that stuff I do, I was a specialist, there are different departments of this, all competing with each other, all hate each other, do not trust each other. They have divergent goals, as Hodson and Al say. They keep secrets from other departments. They will, they will talk to each other in the team over a beer. They will, they will never talk to other departments. They hate and mistrust them. They will not talk to other divisions, other bureaucracies or governments or anything. The whole thing, the, the whole idea of about 50 different US government departments conspiring in 9-11 is just, just ludicrous to, any, to anyone who understands how bureaucracy works. FISMA, FISMA 3-4 is an interesting one. That, that stands for Financial Services and Markets Act, I think, and 348 is a 348th rule, which is then split into any number of subparagraphs. Um, it is a rule protecting confidentiality. Now, confidentiality is another interesting word. It, it comes from Latin meaning trust. So if something is confidential, uh, you've sort of, you're, 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 not, you're not betraying someone's trust. Um, but another word for confidentiality is a, is a secret. So why is FISMA 348 there? It says, it says, if the regulator has received some information from a regulated firm, it is actually a criminal offence to divulge that information outside, unless it's to a prescribed person of some kind. Um, very important rule. It's not saying you can't say what happens in the Bank of England or the PRA. Uh, that's separate. That's covered by your contract of employment. Um, there's also, I think, Official Secrets Act, which is, which is something else. FISMA 348 is explicitly there to protect firms, or rather to, 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 to show firms they can, try, they can give that information to the regulator. Uh, and the reason it's there is otherwise firms would keep everything secret from the regulator. So the regulator is saying, don't worry, 
spill the beans, tell us all about it, we will not tell the general public um, and we'll word it in such a way that it's immune from a freedom of information request. That, that's, that's what it's there for and I, for a long time I never realised that. Um, the purpose is simply to encourage firms to give up their secrets in return for keeping it a secret. Um, and I suppose it's a good thing. It, it stops us turning into some sort of communist state where we can sort of raid, you know, have a dorm raid on the firm, sort of take all its papers. I mean, we don't. That that's kind of a bad thing. We all we all agree. Uh, on the other hand, you're just preserving the mystique and secret secrecy making of the regulator. Um, connected with this is regulatory capture. This is from Wikipedia, by the way, so I'm sure it's right. Um, Form of government failure yeah, occurs when the regulatory agency, which, which should be acting in the public interest, that's what, that's what a regulator is there for, it's to protect us, the ordinary public, it instead advances the commercial or political objectives of special interest groups, Goldman Sachs, whatever, that dominate the industry or sector it's charged with regulating. And that, that happens, I mean, in some kind, I, I, I worked as a regulator on and off for nearly 20 years. I, I never came across any case of actually money changing hands in order to do I never That never happened, and I'm pretty sure it doesn't happen at all. So it's not a case of some other country where, you know, there are backhands of all kinds. That, that does not occur. There's no actual notes. Um, it's a far more subtle, it's a far more subtle form of capture where you meet, you will meet the firms you're regulating, you never meet the general public. So if the general public wants to get to the regulator, they have to phone a switchboard, go through voicemail, uh, never speak to a person, uh, put in a query, and they will never hear back, and they will never know whether anything de anything's been done because there's no requirement on the regulator to say, well, okay, you blew the whistle, but, and here's what we did about it. There's, there's, there's rarely a requirement to do that. So there's the interaction you have as, from the public to the regulator, there's also a thing I spotted when I left, when I left the PRA. Uh, you were used to calling everyone on first name terms. So any firm you'd meet, you, you'd, you'd never call some of my Mr. or Mrs. or Miss. It's always first name terms. As soon as you deal with someone in a bureaucracy from the outside, it's always your title. And, and in a way, that's good. They're respecting you. They're giving you by your title, not, not being familiar with you. On the other hand, it, it's a telling kind of indication of the way that the public the public interacts with a bureaucracy or a regulator. Um, so it happens in all kinds of subtle ways. First name terms versus surnames. Um, sandwiches, you, go, you get sandwiches and biscuits. And there's a story, actually it's a false story, there was a story at the Bank of England and when it met a firm that it wanted to punish, it would put biscuits out on the table covered with the cellophane foam, but um, it would never unwrap it. Um, <laughs> I, I, I mentioned that to a senior, very senior person last year. He said, no, no, that's, that's, that's not true, not true, not true at all. Well, there are various ways. There are various, various ways that the, um, um, also, and, and there was an article on Private Eye, yeah, an article on Private Eye just, just out about what they call the revolving door. So you work for a bit at the regulator. Well, let's say you work at a consultant, one of the auditors or a firm. You go to the regulator for a bit, who will pay you peanuts, well, they'll pay you what you're actually paid, but you know, the, firm, the firm won't profit from it. Uh, you then pick up a whole bunch of stuff that the regulator does. Then you go back. Then you go back to the industry, to the consultant, the auditor, the, the, the commercial firm, and you learn a whole bunch of stuff about how the regulator works, which you can then apply. And, and sometimes, I hope not very often, sometimes you'll, it will consist in going to the regulator, making up some arcane rule or something, and then, then going back to the consultancy and saying, well, this is how we explain this rule. This is how it works. And, you know, pay us 40000 or whatever the usual rate is to, to, to solve that problem. For, to, to solve the problem I have created. So uh, regulatory capture works in all sorts of ways. Um, never involves actual exchange of money, but it, it, it operates in much more powerful ways. Um, I think that's a very old cartoon, but I think that's, um, yeah, that's how the system works. There is an establishment. There, there, it's a different kind of establishment from when this was done, where you had sort of capitalists and, no, we still have the capitalists. We kind of still have the military. I'm not sure who this guy is here, but there is, there is a more left-wing establishment that we have now compared to what we had when it was sort of run by aristocrats a hundred years ago, but, but it's still there. It's very much still there. It just disguises itself and, again, has this sort of unspoken nature. It doesn't matter what political party we're talking about. It, it is there, and, it, and it's a system, and it's not glorious. Um, 
And that's just one bullet point. Yeah, this is, I love this thing about market-sensitive information. Um, there's something called MIFID, which is a, direct, a new direct, it's a directive that they've just implemented. I can't remember what MIFID stands for. They all, each of the letters stand for something. Um, the whole system of MIFID is actually to prevent information freely passing between you know, in your, your capitalist system, you know, between firms. And uh, you know, as Jimmy Wales spotted when he worked on the Merck and this Chicago Mercantile, information is really important. It's valuable. And it kind of wants to be free, but at the same time, it wants to be expensive. And regulations like MIFID say, well, not, not, only, not only is it not free, not only, not only does it want to be expensive, it actually wants to be locked up and, and will prosecute you if, you if you pass this information on to, to anyone else. I mean, I've had considerable experience of this, sort of working with analysts uh, who will say, oh, we can't, you can't tell us that. It's very interesting, but don't tell us what you, we think we you're going to tell us because, you know, we'd be prosecuted for you. For, and I said, well, it's, you know, it's just stuff I found in the public domain and worked out what it all means. And they said, no, no, don't want to know. Um, right, so we've done secrets. We've done bureaucracy. They're secretive. Uh, let's talk about markets. So this is the only bit where I'm really going to talk about financial markets. Um, right, two bits of data. Stocks, stocks this is U.S. data, and it's... Um, it's from, very, I can't read the dates, it's like 1879. It goes back a very, very long way. Um, what I'm showing here is something actually quite simple. Just trace the stock market, which in this case is the S&P. Wait till it gets to a peak, and it's easy to write a program that spots when you've got to a peak, and then trace what's called the drawdown for that peak in percentage terms. So every time you're seeing one of these sort of down to pointing things, um, it means the market has retraced a smaller or massive amount. Um, you can see, does anyone know what that bit is? That very big one. Depression. It is the depression. It's actually the stock market. Remember this we're talking about the stock market, but yes, it, the stock market collapsed dramatically in 1929, fell for about four years after that, and never really recovered. You can see it never recovers till the 1950s. Um, yeah, uh, and, that, and that somehow, and, and actually economists still don't really know, that, that caused the Great Depression. That, that was probably one of the worst. The worst crisis in living memory. Um, and this, this, slide, uh, this slide is actually showing that there's not much, probably much you can do about it. We've passed through many, many sort of eras of regulation, but it, it still happens. The most, most recent one, that's the big crash. That's the 2008 one. Um, but you can see there's nothing like that. So yes. How, how can something go down by 180%? Uh, yes, I used a logarithmic scale is, is the reason. Thank you for spotting that. <laughs> it's the log of, yeah, which I prefer to use, but perhaps can be confusing. Uh, bonds. Now, that's the same period. Um, uh, this just tracks percentage of bond defaults for about the same period, the 1870s uh, to current. Um, what you see there, and this is interesting, is we talk about the 1930s as being bad, but actually... The 1880s were far worse. There was a whole wave of speculation in railways throughout the latter half of the 19th century. And um, uh, lots of interesting schemes were sort of put on the market and quite a lot of them failed. Uh, and, and there's another secret here. There, there is another secret in that our modern system, our current system of regulation assumes that this kind of period here is the norm. After the 1940s, you have this sort of Keynesian, post-Keynesian period where it all seems to quieten down for, for interesting reasons. I'm not going to. Um, before that, it, 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 it's obviously quite bad. Uh, so perhaps regulation has worked, who knows. But, but the, secret, the, the secret of regulation now is that the system assumes that this kind of period, this post-war Keynesian period, will, will persist and will never go back to railway, railway mania. Um, so, yeah, a slight fall in price is the revelation of a small secret. Think of it this way. All price falls means some information has come out which, which someone was keeping secret for whatever reason and is now public. A large fall in price, like you saw with the stock market crash in 29-34, is the revelation of a large secret. It's just, it's just a matter of size. And as, as I've pointed out, regulators and firms conspire to keep secrets. That's what they're about. HBOS. Fantastic. So 08, interestingly, in, in 
In January 2008, HBOS um, put in a regime called Basel II, which was meant to protect firms. It was a capital model meant to protect firms from eroding their capital. Am I doing it? It's 25 2, is it? Yeah, I'll go on. Um, it was meant to protect firms from bankruptcy, one in every, I think it was 1,000 years, 99.9% .9 confidence. Or was it 2,000 years? No, 1,000 years. So in 2008, they put in this regime, the capital regime, that says, yep, you'll now not fail for, for 1,000 years, only once. And then in September, HBOS failed. Um, and the reason for that, there are many reasons underlying what happened in 2008. One, one of them was that just firms like HBOS kept these massive bloody great secrets. There was something they called the Irish book, which really had nothing of any value in it whatsoever. It was quite a large uh, credit book, lending book. And um, gradually this sort of came out as Lloyd's took it over. And gradually, I well, know not gradually, you know, the whole, the whole thing collapsed. Um, and that was a perfect example of something that if people had known about it, market sensitive information, right? Market sensitive information is this, that they're locked up in this case somewhere. It's a sort of whole load of documentation about uh, the Irish book and the Australian book, which, is, which, which if it becomes public will cause this firm to collapse. And, um, you know, the, what we see here is the result of that secret becoming, becoming known. So, uh, passing on to the final part of my talk, uh, we have Jimmy Wales saying the command and control bureaucratic model is doomed to failure. So he's not saying the markets are doomed to failure, the system's doomed to failure. He's saying that method of governance, the establishment, is doomed to failure. And it's, the failure will be caused by the nature of the network, the internet. The internet will change. Remember his writing in the mid, mid to late 1990s when people believed these things, which in my view are completely naive. Um, is that true? Is it? Okay, I'm going to now look at... Possibly six things, no, only five things. What are the checks and balances we have that, that will help us, which will, which will doom the bureaucracy to failure? You know, so the, pu the public interest will prevail over various sort of vested interests. Uh, there are probably more, but I'm going to look at five of these. So whistleblowing. Um, whistleblowing, interesting. I'm not going to talk too much about that, but one obvious problem with whistleblowing is that... Um, when you're in the bureaucracy, you're not just in this impersonal, sort of supposedly Kafkaesque thing. Kafka himself says, no, the bureaucracy is, is made up of people. Um, there is no official meaning, says Kafka. The castle official, the, the castle is the bureaucracy, right? All these statements he's talking about have no official meaning. If you attach official meaning, you're quite mistaken. It's the private meaning, so expressions of friendship or hostility is very great, usually greater than any official meaning could ever be. Right? And that's, that's important. A bureaucracy is made up of people who are friends with each other. They have lunch with each other. They go for drinks with each other, etc., etc. They go to parties. Um, if, you, if you blow the whistle, you are betraying your friends. I mean, who's, who's, who's the greatest traitor? It's Judas. You know, Judas betrayed the, Jesus and the disciples. Um, and that's, and that, that personally, from a personal point of view, makes whistleblowing difficult. There are other things, there are other things about whistleblowing. Uh, you cannot just blow the whistle to the Sunday Times or Private Eye. That's, that's, that you would actually be prosecuted for that because it's all very sensitive. You must disclose it to another, or, to another bureaucracy, usually a different bureaucracy. And um, the whole system assumes that the system will work so that, yeah, in the public interest. But of course it, it doesn't. Uh, there was a case... There was a case actually this week where um, a whistleblower who'd retired from HBOS, or what was HBOS, is in Lloyd's now. Um, he wrote all these emails saying, you know, this, this, these models do not work. These models do not work. Uh, or rather, sorry, the models do work. The model he was talking about did work, and it said that HBOS was completely and utterly insolvent, so they had to replace the model that worked with a model that didn't work and said it was perfectly solvent. Um, and... He only blew the whistle quite recently, uh, once he'd left. I think he retired in 2016. But he complained to a number of sort of other bureaucracies about this, and they all said, oh, no, nothing, nothing to do with us, no, no problem here, nothing to see, let's move on. Um, so it, it's actually whistleblowing, is, because whistleblowing is itself secret, it's actually very hard to make it work, even, even if one has got over this whole thing of betraying one's own organisation. Free press, oh, I love this, yeah. Um, 
I think the internet's a great thing. Nothing wrong with it. Um, but it's, had, it's taken a tremendous toll on the free press. You, know, you used to have investigative teams at the various newspapers who would be paid well, uh, and, and they would follow up. They would follow up stories, and they were genuinely, because the readers, the, because the readers paid for the newspaper, um, they would genuinely follow stuff up. Um, now, if you, if you know the London Evening Standard, that is now a free paper, which is great. It's free. You know, it seems to be making money somehow. We don't know. And it's owned by someone called Evgeny Lebedev, Russian owner. I looked him up on Wikipedia, and it says all these great things. He takes a hands-off approach. He sports press freedom, presumably open data, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'm not denying this. This is true. I'm just saying that's what Wikipedia says. And um, then I looked up who'd actually written this. Remember, anyone can edit Wikipedia. Plus, anyone who edits Wikipedia has the right to remain secret. And the idea there is if you're editing from China or any repressive, um, any, any repressive non-democratic company, um, if you're editing from there, it's essential you remain secret. And that, that's, a good, that's a good thing. So th there's the edit that I found. And if you get a copy of the presentation, you can look it up. Some person called some you know, IG3IDT, some in, indecipherable and completely secret um, IP address, uh, wrote that. So we, we don't know if it's true or not. And, 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 and look, you know, look what happened with open data. Private eye, I think, is great. And it's a good example of how something that's completely sort of a complete dinosaur, it's print only. Uh, you pay to read it. It's very little reliance on advertising, apart from the weird stuff at the back. It's actually, circulation is growing, and it's got a really good investigative team. I don't know how they pay for it. I reckon its income, its revenue must be no more than £13 million pounds a year. Who can operate that in London? But it, 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 it works. Uh, and it's read at senior levels in the bank. And it privatised a kind of bit of the establishment that's not, no one really knows where to fit it. But, uh, you know, it's there. And it's a good example of the sort of openness that used to exist, but which the internet has kind of... Right, oh, the Flat Earth Movement, yeah. I mean, I could not believe there was a thing, but you look on YouTube, uh, YouTube Flat Earth, and there's all this sort of stuff there, and, and you say, well, how could you believe that? There are, uh, there are scientific reasons. So we've known that the Earth was round since 2500 um, BC. No, 500, 500 BC. BCE, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, no, but... but it used to be there was no way for sort of people who believed otherwise to get together, and they stayed segregated. And now they have YouTube and the internet. Bloody hell, you know. Uh, how can there be such a thing? Well, there is. The, you know, Google, Illuminati, Google, all this stuff. You know, there's, there's tons of this on the internet. Um, why does it exist? Well, because of the internet. Yeah. Information wants to be free. Who said that? From Tess. Stuart Brand in the 1970s, I think. He was an early advocate of open data. Uh, he actually, this is a mis misquote, he actually said it actually also wants to be expensive and there's a tension there. Um, but as I was saying earlier, information kind of wants to be free. Yeah, the secret wants to be released, but at the same time, it's a secret. It also wants to be expensive, wants to be locked up. Uh, the law, civil law is, a, is, is another great democratic process, which we have had for ages and ages. Um, if a firm has done something bad to you, if it's, if it's damaged you as, as a member or members as a group of the public, uh, you can actually sue the buggers. Um, you can get what's called a class action or a group action. Uh, you will put some money in the pot. And, and, and currently, there's quite a good, I think, a good system where a, a hedge fund or investor will actually say, OK, we'll get you know, no win, no fee. We'll invest in this. Uh, if you win, we'll get, I know, 20%, 50% of, of the winnings. Um, that, I think, is great because you don't have to run this paternalistic regulator to represent your, your interest as the public. Um, wh why would a regulator do that? Why would a regulator act in the public interest? We've seen they don't. Um, proceedings are open and transparent. Yeah, they're all published. You can look up on the, on the Internet. Um, uh, you can look at all these cases. Uh, uh, the downside, I think, is it's horrendously expensive. It's risky. And you also you get judges who aren't, don't always act in the most... And barristers who don't always act in the most logical way. It's uh, a court case is theatre. It's not, it's not logic. And parliamentary democracy. I'm nearly the end. I think we've got four on hour, have we? Um, yeah, members, members of parliament have a really strong sense of who they represent. I've, never, I've been involved in various ways for many, many years with, with parliamentary democracy. And you know, people say politicians are awful. They change their mind a lot. Well, the reason they do that is because they see whether if, if, if the public changes its mind, then the, the parliamentarian changes their mind. That's a good thing. 
They should be representing what the public wants, and that's what they're there for. So they have a very strong sense of who they represent, um, but they're not well funded. I, I see a lot of sort of Whitehall in my travels around, and uh, you get a sense of the organisation from the amount they spend on the building itself. The, the PRA, although it complains, actually had a very nice, very nice set of offices. Um, so in a way does the bank, except it was built in 1930 and never really been decorated since then. Um, but yeah, it's not. And, but if you go to the sort of the parliamentary offices, the, the, these are sort of <laughs> really not so not so good. Um, so not well funded. I, I think that there should be ways of there should be ways of um, funding of funding that form of public interest in a better way. Members of Parliament are generalists, not specialists. Yeah, you, you, you talk about problems with finance. Now, I'll talk to an MP and they say, OK, it's, it's all about discounting. It's about discount rates, right? Discount rates are actually not a very complicated bit of finance, but, but they're slightly complicated. It involves percentages. Um, uh, you talk about discount rates and, and they just, you can see the curtains sort of fall, their eyes glaze over. And, and, and they're generous. So they want, they, want, they want the case presenting in 15 minutes, 10 minutes, 5 minutes. They want a few sentences. This is what is going wrong. It's sort of often very hard for a specialist like me, who naturally thinks in terms of the complexities of something, to represent it to a parliamentarian in a way that sort of brings out the full horror of it, but, um, but in a way that makes sense to that person. That's, 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 that, that's difficult. And the, the same sort of skill actually applies to talking to any senior person. Um, I never really mastered that. Uh, and also the current system doesn't... Yeah, the current system was set up in, in the era when people lived in a hamlet or something. You didn't travel around much. You had constituencies, and the interests of one constituency would not be that of the other. Now, we, we, you know, we have, we've had the railways, we've had public transport, all sorts of transport. Now we have the internet. Uh, we have working from home, mobile working, people working in different countries. There is no way in which geography represents a set of interests. You know, pensioners. Pensioners are everywhere perhaps more of them in Eastbourne than elsewhere, and perhaps fewer of them in London, but you get the point. Um, leaseholders everywhere, uh, although, interestingly, the, 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 some of the success, I think, of the leasehold campaign was that there were more, there were more leaseholders in the North West, I think. Seb will know. Um, workers, again, workers used to be in specific industries, and I think the railways used to have, like, nine railway MPs, uh, but we don't have that. Workers are everywhere. There are teleworkers. They work in um, call centres and so forth. There's no way now that geography represents interest, and, and that's, we don't have a system whereby the public can easily be represented in Parliament. So that's about it. Uh, so bureaucracies form naturally. There are strong, in my view, strong natural forces which promote the formation of a bureaucracy, and, and this is human nature. They are by their nature secretive, they have this mystique, they have this unspoken nature or ethos which they can never even articulate to themselves. They're easily captured by those they regulate, and I think that's it. They are not necessarily doomed to fail. For that reason, there are checks and balances to limit their power. Yeah, I was uh, just quickly on here, I'm doing some research at the moment which requires uh, looking at the company's house database, um, which is on the internet, and that's fine. Now, the internet's great, that the internet is great to get data that you're reading only. Um, so Companies House has all this stuff that's actually written on paper and scanned in in PDF files. Um, and actually that, and, and that requires a company to sort of have signatories to you know with the people, who the people are, where they live, all that sort of stuff. That system was developed, I don't know when, but obviously a long time ago, and obviously some smart person or some decent person said, yeah, we cannot have companies ripping people off, and one way to stop that is for them to declare who they are who they represent, uh, what, what the, who the senior people are in that, and, and, and also where they live, um, which the internet is kind of against. You know, you, can, you, you go to the internet and look for a firm, what is actually their physical address? Um, I, I, I sometimes actually write paper letters to people, um, and I think the thing about a paper letter is, it's not the sort of, if you write it with sort of handwriting and people see it, it has a mystery about it that um, nowadays didn't used to. Uh, you know, there's all this crap they get from sort of telemarketing, junk, junk mail, junk physical mail. So you see a letter that's sort of handwritten. It's, it's interesting. So a, a paper letter has a mystery that an email doesn't, he said. Um, so, yeah, there are lots of checks and balances in the system, which were devised a long time ago. Pa pa writing stuff down on paper was one of them. Um, the Internet doesn't necessarily help that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we've got ten minutes for questions. 
Uh, that's the, the, the Umias project, it's called. Uh, our idea is to be a sort of... That's Umias. He's keeping an eye on the palaces of power there. And that's a river of lava that sort of represents um, Judgment Day, actually. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much, Steve, for that presentation. Uh, I'd like to open the floor now for any potential questions that anyone of the audience has for Dean. Yeah, sure. Just speak into the mic if you can. Well, I'm very glad that there's a, a, a hint of optimism and that regulation doesn't necessarily fail. Um, but, uh, I mean, it's not a deterministic thing. I mean, these uh, regulation regulators and bureaucracies can be refreshed. They can be directed to do the job that they were originally established um, uh, to do. Um, and it's a constant ebb and flow, isn't it? And uh, um, I, I, I do plead for the internet over conventional publishing as a means to link people up, to do good, and to keep an eye. I mean, we met over the internet. We met over the internet. So and, uh, and you know, there, are, there are positive things here as well for you know, I, uh, I wanted younger to people say in the audience. Uh, it isn't just a deterministic... I, I, wanted, <laughs> I, I had this last section. I wanted to say some positive things, but I thought, well, let's say the negative things. And, and yeah, you're quite right. People meet over the internet. They form these discussion groups. But then, you know, the Flat Earth Society can form on the internet. This is, this is the whole problem, isn't it? You, you have to be taken seriously. Uh, if you form on the internet, if you have a blog, for example, um, someone called Jonathan Ford writes for the FT, and uh, pretty much everything he writes, there's always some person who says, oh, uh, Jonathan, that's a load of old rubbish. You, why, why don't you just start a website and write a blog instead of writing for proper newspapers? So there's this whole thing that the internet really is not being taken seriously still, I think. Blogs aren't being... Blogs were the great thing. I remember the 2000s. Yeah, write, write a blog. Well, yeah, there are bloody millions of blogs. You know, there's only one FT. Sorry, does that address your point? Yeah, and I'll just make one point about... I mean, it's not a point I did actually raise with uh, private eyes. Why doesn't it digitalise its its archives? Mm. It's quite a strategic act, that, actually. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's to do with risk, because uh, there's not actually much point in um, suing private eye for defamation, given that in two or three weeks it'll be forgotten as a sort of printed bit of paper. But if it was around online, well, then they would. Then you could sue them, you mean? Well, then you would sue them. It was you worth would. doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi. Um, y so you have this um, assertion that bureaucracies form naturally and there's natural yeah, forces. That, that's a tentative hypothesis. Okay. Not I was borne out by any research that I know of. I was going to ask about what you think those forces are, because I think with your comments on the internet as well, that it shows the tension between, you know, we have like, we often have a really uh, binary approach mm. to talking about how humans organise. So it's either decentralize everything without much real thought to what that means or you know have have some kind of command and control structure without yeah. much thought so to what, what that forces? means. So what forces? What are the forces? That will, that will push You know the forward. forces that make weeds grow? Weeds, weeds are unkindly called that because they're actually very powerful things. They, they, weeds, weeds will prevail. Yeah? Um, so what your question is what, what forces promote the formation of a bureaucracy? Difficult one. I think I've mentioned one, which is that a bureaucracy is a very good way for a, someone who's not a complete genius, which you know, 99.9% .9 of us are not not a genius, uh, to flourish. It's a very good way. You get a title um, if you in an organisation like Goldman Sachs, and you really obey the system. There's a whole series of levels in in, in organisations like Goldman Sachs. Um, and, and KPMG, they're all the same. Uh, so you work for Peanuts, which is actually not Peanuts. So an associate at KPMG might earn 40,000, 50,000, which is way above the average income uh, in the UK. So, but what, what's the organisation is Peanuts. Um, and then by this blind submission to power, and that's very, very important, you never disagree. You, you must obey these lines of power that radiate downwards. Eventually you get to I know, manager, senior manager, director. Then there's this thing called a partner. What the partner does is runs a business within the consultancy or in Goldman's or whatever. Um, they will send out people to do a project who are being paid the, the peanuts, uh, and they will collect something like half of all the revenue and give the rest, probably more, immense amount of money. A, 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 good, a, a senior partner at a, at a strong, either a law firm or a consultancy, will be taking 800, 1 million more. Um, so there are strong forces that the... the 
a bureaucracy is very powerful, right? If, it, if it's a commercial bureaucracy, it's, making, it's taking a lot of stuff out of the system and I'm probably overrunning. Uh, if it's a public bureaucracy, it has a different kind of power. Not commercial power, but sort of real, real government power. Um, that, that encourages a bunch of people to get together and make themselves powerful. It is a form of empowerment, but it's not necessarily a good form of empowerment. That, I think, is the rule that makes... That's what makes bureaucracies flourish. That's, that's just a theory. I mean, there may be many reasons. Great. Any more questions? We might have time for one more, potentially. Anna? Thank you. What does this relationship between firms and regulators... How how does this impact fintechs and startups trying to emerge in the financial industry? It, not much. I mean, one, one virtue of the regulatory system where you have the light touch system is that it pretty much ignores anything that goes on in smaller firms. So, you know, I was looking at both in banks, banks and insurance companies, the top 50 firms. These are very big, very powerful, commercially powerful entities. Um, anything else... Not very much. I mean, it won't help, but it won't hinder. So you can get a lot of very bad things going on. You know, people get ripped off by small firms as much as a large firm. Uh, that will tend to be... The, the regulator simply doesn't have the resources to deal with that. Uh, but on the other hand, it won't, it won't hinder them either. So it's, it's an interesting force, I think. Is there someone else? Have we got time? No. Yeah, sure. Yes? Oh, one, one last one. Go ahead. So you mentioned Companies House, and of course the information available from Companies House started being available many years ago. Yeah, um, I don't know when, but it, yes. That's yes, right, Where, whereas there are other examples which perhaps are being hindered by, e.g. GDPR, um, the information available on who is, for instance, or yeah, yeah. indeed uh, who actually owns UK bank accounts, as opposed, I think, to bank accounts in... Crown colonies, or whatever they call them these days. Any comments? Sorry, uh, any comments on what what data is now available that wouldn't have been available? Uh, well, uh, 10, 20 are we years in fact ago? seeing a restriction in this respect? Uh, I don't know much about GDPR. I sort of hate. Um, uh, I, I also hate this sort of stuff that says, please allow our cookies. We're not going to tell you what they're for, <laughs> right? We're, you're, you're still going to have to sort of, yes. we're still going to impose this on you, but we, we, now you're going to allow us to do that, whereas before you didn't, yeah? So, I mean, uh, what else? The Whois stuff, I think they've, that's, that's restricted now, isn't it? It's not, so, you, you can actually stop Whois from seeing your the yeah. personal details, yeah. 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 <laughs> Sorry, the... You can, but should you? I mean, you can hide behind all sorts of nominees, effectively. You can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can hide behind all sorts of... Yes, and, there's, and, and that existed before the internet. Yes. Yeah, that's true. Um, what do I think? I don't know. I don't know what I think, actually. I can talk a little bit about yeah. the problem. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Hi, thank you for your Hi. talk. Um, so I work for a company called Open Corporates and we, we think a lot about these kind of issues of GDPR and access to information and I think we are um, at a real turning point um, in, as how we think about this as a society. Um, I think one of the interesting things about GDPR is that it talks a lot about um, public benefit exemption and, and journalistic exemption and um, going forward I think it's not just about it's not just about having access to the data, it's also about people using that data and coming up with public benefit impacts from it, which um, ultimately in, an, in a much longer fight and sort of struggle over access to information is going to be really crucial going forward for GDPR. I'm not quite sure if that answers the question, but I'd be happy to, to talk about it afterwards as well. But I think, um, I think so much of this is about the impact and how we use that data and how that feeds back into how the data is regulated rather than just should that data be open in itself. Does that make sense? Actually, you've reminded me of something that I came across a few weeks ago. Um, I was trying to tease out some clear conflict of interest in a quite a major institution. Um, it's a professional institution, not, 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 a, not a public one, not a statutory one. And I wanted to know who was in charge of a project. And normally, you would have seen, uh, there, was a, there was a slideshow they gave a presentation which actually had all the names of the people. And I wanted to know 
not to say who they were, but who they actually worked for. Because I said, I'm sure these people actually all work for the industry and they're just pretending to be professionals. And they said, no, you can't. GDPR prevents that. So that, that's, that's a bad example. Before, before you have a list of names of people, here are the people on the project, it's published here, go to the library, find it. Now there are increasing pressures to restrict that flow of information. Yeah, does that strike the, a chord? Yeah, totally does. But one of the interesting things about GDPR is if there are GDPR issues, they apply whether that data set is open or closed. So, you know, I think the, the case is we leave the struggle for GDPR and we have that fight there. But any, this is, it's also about the information that people can get for free and the information that people have to pay for access. And at least from my experience, I've found GDPR comes up as a major issue for the information that is free. And um, mm -hmm. I may not be involved in those conversations, and they could be going on secretly behind closed doors, as you were saying earlier. But um, a lot of the, the arguments around GDPR don't necessarily... So GDPR is a bad thing on, on balance? Um, no, I think data protection is a really, really important and crucial thing, but getting that right and being aware that GDPR yeah. was a bill, was a, was a law that was drafted quite quickly and, um, <laughs> you know... As most laws are. <laughs> as most <laughs> laws are, but, you know, the, uh, the UK implemented GDPR two days before... Uh, you know, it had to come into effect, and and um, the impact of that means that you know I think there are a lot of unanswered questions within GDPR that need to be answered. I think we need to. We're done. Yes. So thank you everyone for your comments and your questions. I'm sure Dean is more than happy to answer any questions uh, following the end of this. If if anyone does have any co final comments, um, and thank you very much for attending today. Well, thank you for coming.